you, uh, you know, he doesn't just do live demos. He does crazy live demos. It's, it's awesome. So we, uh, we go from, uh, from space traveler to, uh, to, to an individual that uh, was involved in, in uh, NASA along with a number of others um, when we first launched OpenStack. Um, next up, we have uh, Chris Kemp along with a special guest for our next keynote. So Chris Kemp. So this is so cool having all of you guys here. There's actually another room I just saw a video of. We've got about 250 people in a breakout room. It couldn't fit into this room. So before I get started, I just wanted to welcome a special guest. Uh, I think a lot of you have uh, followed the news this week. Uh, we've actually got a really exciting new member in the OpenStack community. And I wanted to uh, welcome Chris Pinkham, uh, the uh, inventor and advocate that created EC2 over at Amazon. Uh, I'm going to grab him up here and, and have him say a few words. Uh, Chris Pinkham, everyone, CEO of Nimula. Uh, morning, everybody. It's always uh, awesome to get on stage after a fellow South African giving such an eloquent presentation. Um, Mark and I both went to a UCT, I think me a little bit before he did. And so thank you very much uh, for, uh, for, for being here. Thank you very much for building OpenStack. A huge thank you to Chris for uh, both inviting me on stage as well as being a, a key um, lever in getting Nimbular involved in the OpenStack community. And I, I promised I wouldn't take too many of his cycles away from talking, but I would just like to sort of reflect on the fundamental question of why we are here. And, and I'm sure for most of you, at a certain level, it's about standards and interfaces and implementations and building really get great product. And we have several of uh, our engineering team at Nimbula here uh, this week to explore how we can bring our own learning, our own code, um, some of the tricks uh, we have in our own tool bag, as well as how we can build a great Nimbula product set around a core OpenStack platform. So at a certain level, that's why we're here. Um, at a very much higher level, you're kind of on your own. I have no idea. Um, somewhere in the middle, though, why I've been working on what I've been working on for the last 10 years, it's really about innovation, as Mark said. It's fundamentally about developer agility and how do we extract cost, time, and effort from the business of building infrastructure and apply that to the development and um, improvement of new applications. So for me, it's all about innovation. Um, it's been a consistent theme for the last 10 years, EC2, Nimbular, and now in the OpenStack community. Um, whatever level we're talking about, it is very good to be here, and I, I greatly appreciate the, uh, the influence Chris had in, in getting us here today. So uh, with that, I'll restore you to your scheduled programming and uh, look forward to speaking to you this week. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Welcome to OpenStack. These guys have a great team and a great product that's actually been deployed in a lot of large-scale uh, deployments, and they're going to be participating in a lot of the sessions here, listening to you all, uh, trying to figure out what technology uh, from their stack can be included in OpenStack, and also how they can complement and productize uh, OpenStack and, and deliver it to a new class of customers that operate extreme scale. So I um, wanted to talk to you guys today. I've got a, a couple of slides here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I was the CTO at NASA for a number of years. And uh, while there, I had the uh, great opportunity to partner with uh, Lou Mormon and Jim Curry and the team over at Rackspace uh, to really advocate for OpenStack on day zero. And it was a uh, real honor to, to be able to uh, see this evolve from uh, 20 people to uh, the thousands of people that it is today. So um, you know, what I'm not going to talk about today, isn't that an awesome logo slide? Uh, is the number of companies that uh, are represented by the individual members, because uh, there's almost 1,000 companies uh, here. There's an equally impressive list of companies that um, have um, affiliated uh, or affiliated with uh, the, the members of the foundation. And each of those is actually a, an individual logo of a, a member. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about. Um, all the public supporters that have come out and put their logos, the companies that have said, we are behind OpenStack. These are the logos you'll find on the website. We're not going to talk about all of you guys. Um, if you upload your pictures, you'll be in the next keynote. I'm uh, not going to talk about all the folks that have um, invested. Uh, there's a bunch of corporate members, gold members, platinum members. Uh, there's a bunch of folks that have uh, really stepped up and contributed code to OpenStack. I wish we weren't. Uh, in the top three, 
Um, I'd really like to uh, have a closer correlation uh, between the companies that have lots of members and the companies that make lots of code contributions in the future. I'm not going to flash a logo slide of companies that haven't contributed, but there, uh, I, wish, I wish there were more, uh, more contributors. I'm not going to talk about Nebula either. Um, I'm not going to talk about OpenStack. Uh, I'm not going to talk about where it came from. I'm not going to talk about who's using it. Uh, I'm not going to talk about who's building stuff on it. What are we going to talk about? I'm going to talk about why we're all here. And as we all go into the 237 different sessions uh, that have been organized by you, um, what I think we're all here to do. And that's to, to serve customers and to build applications on this platform. And so I want to talk a little bit about the platform uh, that we've built and the platform that we're building and how it needs to evolve. So, oh my goodness, that was ridiculous. You guys get a preview. So I want to start here. You know, that's just wrong. That's what I get for using Windows. That one's for you, Mark. So, you know, one of the ways we look at the stack that we're building is applications running on platforms, Juju, OpenShift, what have you, uh, running on top of infrastructure services that are often virtualized but can run on bare metal, running on top of infrastructure. And I think that while this is a compelling and simple way to view the world, um, and you can even make this slightly more uh, interesting and rational by saying, well, some applications are going to run directly on infrastructure services, and some applications will run on platform services, and then some applications are going to run on some mixture uh, of platform services and infrastructure services that are fundamentally running on the same infrastructure. I argue, <laughs> my goodness. Yeah. I would argue that this is kind of a fiction. I'm going to go past that really quickly. My goodness. I'm <laughs> I clearly needed more Red Bull this morning. Yeah. So, <laughs> Jesus. All right, this is ridiculous. You're going to remember this presentation. You're going to see it five times before it's over. <laughs> but that stack where we have applications neatly running on top of platform and infrastructure services, running on top of one infrastructure, I would argue is fiction. And I might argue that again a few more times before this is over. <laughs> this is so much fun. Yeah, we all know that. I think it actually just broke. I think I killed the battery in this trying to, there we go. So what I'd like to kind of argue is that applications in the real world are actually running on top of much more complex service architectures and infrastructures. Um, most enterprises today don't have just one infrastructure uh, that they're building clouds on. They have multiple. And whether these infrastructure layers are uh, provided by one or more different uh, platforms, they're typically running on more than one different generation of infrastructure. And I think the differences in infrastructure are going to be even more uh, profound over the years to come. Uh, if we look at uh, right now, we're replacing all of the last generation of Intel x86 infrastructure with new Sandy Bridge Romley infrastructure. Um, this is, are you gonna take all of the old stuff and just decommission it, or are you gonna try to run um, in this environment where you have both new and old infrastructure. Um, when ARM becomes more prolific, uh, are we going to start to see a hybrid infrastructure layer that provides both ARM and x86? Um, I think the reality is we're going to see uh, a heterogeneous environment at the infrastructure layer, and I also see uh, having more heterogeneity in the platform layer as well. Uh, I think that the whole idea that there is a single platform to rule them all is the fiction here. Uh, I think that as we start to see uh, the way people build applications on the cloud, uh, each application uh, will have unique characteristics that will lend itself to running well on certain platform services, and, and some of those platform services will lend, them well, lend themselves well to running on infrastructure services, and some of those platform services will need to run on bare metal. Uh, database services are a great example. Um, having direct access to um, 
disk uh, architectures that provide uh, much uh, faster uh, read-write performance, more IOPS. I think as we start to look at um, the way we view storage, there won't just be block storage and object storage. Uh, there will be many tiers of block storage and object storage. And I think that these different platform layers will be exposed to an application. That's a single application on top. And what developers want is they want to be able to take advantage of all the innovation, not just in this room, in this community, but all the innovation occurring across different, uh, in different ecosystems, different platform layers, uh, and different um, platform services. Um, you just saw uh, uh, Mark Shuttleworth talk about a bunch of charms that had been developed for Juju. Um, there wouldn't be hundreds of charms if there weren't hundreds of compelling infrastructure services that people were using to build applications. And if any of you have built an application uh, and have chosen the wrong um, database to run that application on, or the wrong architecture, or the wrong infrastructure to run it on, uh, you, uh, and had to rewrite the application, uh, you'll, you'll appreciate why this starts to make sense. So if you're an enterprise or a large service provider that has hundreds of thousands of customers, uh, you might have many more of these infrastructures and many more of these platform services to meet the varied needs of tens or hundreds of thousands of applications. I'm going to click this button again. <laughs> Magic. So I'd like to propose, I'm, I'm going to click this less uh, as a function of time here, but I'm going to propose a slightly different way of thinking about uh, the stack. Um, we've, we've often thought about the stack as this linear thing where things are built on top of uh, other components. But if you put the application at the center of the stack, and you start to think of an application um, often needing to consume different platform services from different infrastructure providers, perhaps even running on different bare metal infrastructure, you start to have a much richer view of what we need to do as a community here. Um, if, you start, if you think about the attributes of cloud computing, on-demand, elastic, shared, metered, accessible software and services, you start to appreciate how if you just have one, uh, one platform layer that attempts to abstract everything, how it's difficult to achieve uh, what you're trying to achieve in the cloud. So as we think about our stack right now with Horizon and Keystone, Nova, Glance, Swift, and Quantum, we've often talked about um, moving this, um, wow, wow. So I just want to I want to end on one slide because if I keep pressing this button, it's going to drive me crazy. Yeah, this is crazy. Yeah, that stay there. I'm done. <laughs> done. Um, so I wanted to I wanted you to think about this uh, and think about as we as we look at all the different applications that people are running on top of OpenStack, the different core services that will be required to run those applications at scale. If you go back to Nimbula. Uh, and you go back to pre-Nimbula, the days at Amazon, uh, when S3 had first come out, there was a queuing service that actually preceded uh, S3, uh, which is interesting because it didn't have any place to store or a system to operate on data, but it was a queuing service. Um, the queuing service was there uh, to manage tasks that had a lot of different elements in them and, and large workloads that needed to run over a long period of time, where you could count on uh, elements within those workloads being executed reliably. Um, we don't really have that in OpenStack. You have to run that in an application on the infrastructure layer. And if you need to make that reliable, that's your problem, right? Um, there is no DNS service in OpenStack today. There is no way that uh, we all agree as a community as we assign names to instances. And this is all, you know, frankly, it came out of NASA because it, the, NASA was a pain to deal with DNS people. And that's why I didn't get into Nova. I mean, so there, this wasn't a strategic thing. This was an arbitrary thing that just came out of the organization. And one of the problems with a project that's only two years old is often a lot of that, um, a lot of the issues that were part of the original project still manifest themselves today. And what I don't want is the 50% of new people in the room to look at OpenStack as it is today as the right, perfect architecture for private cloud. In fact, it's the wrong architecture. And if, if I can leave you with anything, because I'm not touching that button again, <laughs> uh, it's that there's a lot of work to do here. Uh, and in order to successfully run applications at scale 
in a public cloud or in a private cloud powered by OpenStack, there are a lot of core services that we need to build into OpenStack. And if we do this right, Juju will continue to work as a layer on top of this, and developers will still get to experience a lot of it. In fact, Juju could tap into some of these core services and make uh, those services available to developers using the, the Juju framework. This is where Cloud Foundry could fit in. This is where other, you know, as, as we start to look at ways to enable people to solve problems on OpenStack, we have to start thinking about the foundation and what should be in the foundation and what should not be in the foundation. And what I'd like to, uh, what I'd like to encourage you all to do as you go into the hundreds of sessions that follow um, is remember, you've seen this presentation five times, so you have <laughs> you know, no reason not to remember it. But as you, as you have conversations about you know, what is OpenStack and what should be a core project, think about solving problems for, think about running applications at cloud scale and think about what's missing. Think about what every single person needs to get running in OpenStack to get a cloud application running. Uh, if we don't go down this path, uh, we, will, we will build VMware. You know? And I, I don't think that's where anybody in this room wants to go. No offense to VMware. It's, I think there's 25 years of software that shouldn't run anywhere else. But I think the next 25 years of software um, need to have a foundation uh, that allows us to uh, all have a common way. I was, I was listening to um, some large enterprise CIOs the other week talk about the challenges they have with public cloud and private cloud. And if OpenStack gets it right, the same underlying core technology will power public clouds and private clouds. And we'll see true workload portability, true interoperability with management tools, um, true common views on how we view security and compliance across these systems. And if we get it right, you can't just treat public cloud infrastructures as black boxes anymore, Amazon. You have to expose what's happening because if you have a certain level of visibility, if you achieve compliance in your private cloud and you move an application into the public cloud and you lose a lot of those core elements of, of logs and auditability and what's, what's happening, um, you, can no longer, you can no longer envision using, uh, for a lot of workloads, a public cloud. And so I think what we have an opportunity in OpenStack to do if you look at this in the, in the list of services on the left, monitoring, accounting, auto-scaling, basic orchestration, if we can get these into the architecture successfully, uh, we have an opportunity to define what Amazon does next. You can do that. You have that opportunity today. And the opportunity is HP and other public cloud providers will implement these things if they're in OpenStack and then the private cloud providers, the Ubuntu's and the Red Hat's out there, will expose these things, and then people will start building security policy that requires common view across public and private cloud infrastructures. You know, this is, this is the key to making this work, is getting the, this core technology into OpenStack, so regardless of whether you're dealing with a public cloud or a private cloud, the APIs are talking the same language. And then we'll start to see Amazon implement what we're doing and not the other way around. And we'll start to see whole new applications for workloads. I've, I've often said that IT is a $3 trillion industry. Amazon has around $10 billion by rough estimates based on their, their filings with the SEC. So even if they were $100 billion, that is a small fraction of what people invest and spend on IT every year. And so you know, I just want you to realize that that logo slide, the, the slide you saw 15 times, uh, there are a lot of companies here because they see an opportunity for their products and their services to fit into this ecosystem. And the question you should ask yourself is, if my whole company were an API, what would it expose? What methods would it expose? What could I do with my company's API? And then ask yourself, is that an application? And if it is, in order to run that application on OpenStack, what do I need under the covers? to ensure regulatory compliance, to ensure customers are happy with the performance of the application, whatever. And so as we start to, I, I, I just like to propose this, because the other things I'm gonna propose, I don't wanna, I don't wanna mess with this thing. It's scary, scary, scares me. 
Um, and I think if we all start to um, if we all start to have this conversation over the next three or four days, um, I'm really excited about what's going to happen. And I, I'm just going to say thank you. I think. Oh, there we go. There we go. Thank you very much. All right, so <clears throat> Chris proves that uh, you don't have to do a demo <laughs> to run into crazy technical glitches. Um, so that concludes the, uh, the keynote session for today. There are um, a number of sessions that are going on. Lunch is going to be at, at 12.30. Um, we, we're actually going to be taking the back of the room and turning it into Manchester E and F. So there are a couple of sessions that are going to be on, going, to be going there. They may start a few minutes late if you were going to go to those. But other than that, thank you all. We'll uh, see you around the halls and see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>